uh, there's a phrase that I often hear, oh, he or she will get over it, or they'll never remember it, you know, speaking in the context of a child. Well, of course, they might not have a verbal or explicit memory of something, but these traumas, um, and it, it doesn't need to be something accidental, but um, something neglected in childhood or um, shaming or contempt or betrayal. There may not be any words for it, but it's certainly laid down in a person's body, in their cells, and the body remembers. And that, that will influence how they view life. They will see life through that trauma lens. Hi, I'm Naomi Murphy, and this is the Locked Up Living podcast, where we talk with a wide range of people about harsh aspects of institutional life. We also explore some of the ways to overcome them and to grow and develop. I'm David Jones. So join us every Wednesday morning, six o'clock UK time, for a fresh podcast. So today's guest is Margie Wright. Margie grew up in Zimbabwe before going to university in South Africa, where she studied zoology and entomology. As an entomologist, entomologist she worked in biological control and her job took her to the Sudan. Afterwards she had the experience of living in Egypt where she was involved in setting up and volunteering for Befrienders Cairo which is a Samaritans abroad for 10 years. Returning to the UK she trained as a transpersonal psychotherapist at the Centre for Counselling and Psychotherapy Education in London and currently she runs her own private practice as a therapist and supervisor with a focus on developmental trauma, having also trained in two approaches effective in trauma therapy, sensory motor psychotherapy and internal family systems therapy. She's a member of staff at CCPE and runs workshops entitled Trauma and the Transpersonal and details of Margie's website can be found in the show notes. Really glad to have you on today, Margie. Good to see you. Thank you, Naomi. Hi, David. Hi, Margie. Very nice to meet you. Thanks for coming along today. So that's a very interesting background. So you trained initially as an entomologist and then went on to train as a psychotherapist. Was that always your plan? No. Um, I initially set out to to work in biological control as an entomologist. That's the use of natural enemies to control invasive species um, of plants and other insects and maybe sometimes even animal you know mammals Um, but I I started off doing that Um, I used to work at um, Birkbeck College and Kew Royal Botanic Gardens and my job took me to the Sudan where I met the man who's now my husband um, Alan and Later on, I followed him to Egypt, where as uh, I I didn't work in entomology, I just did a whole lot of other jobs. I worked as um, uh, I helped run a an art gallery at one point, and I did some editing as well. I worked for a clinical pathologist, but while I was there, I met. Um, well, the wife of one of my husband's friends who had been a Samaritan here in London, and she and her husband were um, with the British Embassy, and Lillian was very keen on setting up a branch of the Samaritans in in Egypt and invited me to to join her in this venture. And, um, of course, the Samaritans is primarily a listening service, Um, for the prevention of suicide and I just found that it came really naturally to me I really enjoyed doing it so when I returned to the UK in 2002 um, I decided I'd try and reinvent myself as a a counsellor so I did a year's um, foundation course in counselling found I liked it and then continued to study psychotherapy. So that's a long answer to your question. (laughs) Well, it's not really a very long answer, given the extraordinary breadth and depth of your experience that you just touched upon, really. And uh, it doesn't sound like too much of a a, a jump. It sounds as if when you 
decided to shift towards counselling and psychotherapy, that you were building on some skills that you already had. But why psychotherapy rather than one of the other helping professions? I think it was the listening component to it. Um, um, I, certainly with um, the Samar Samaritans, the thing I liked about it was that you didn't have to offer advice. Um, it was more um, empowering people to find the way themselves. And I really particularly liked that. I also liked um, the anonymity that goes with it and the confidentiality. So it's done, done quietly. Um, of course, some people talk about it, but not others. And I, I, I particularly like that. Um, and I found I could do it. A lot of people would come to me and talk to me um, quite naturally. So it, it just felt really organic. But that's the path I, I chose. So, so does what you've just been describing, does that, I don't know much about transpersonal psychotherapy. So the question I'm asking is from that position. What you've just been describing, does that naturally flow into uh, becoming a transpersonal psychotherapist? Yeah. Um, it was as if the transpersonal chose me. Um, they say if there's a student, the teacher will find you. And um, it was um, as a result of the foundation course I did, the person who was my tutor on it um, recommended um, the Centre for Counselling and Psychotherapy Education in London as a place where I could train. That's when I went to her and said, you know, I really want to pursue this as a career. And so she suggested that. I have to confess that I did very, very little research into other um, training schools or colleges. Um, I contacted CCP. They had an um, open day. I went to it. I enjoyed it. And I enrolled and was interviewed, you know. Um, and then, yeah, I think it was only latterly then I thought, oh, gosh, you know, transpersonal, what is it? Um, and I still find that that um, question very, very difficult to answer because it's so, well, it's so transpersonal. There aren't really any words. It's, it's sort of beyond um, the rational in a way. It's beyond time and space as we know it. <clears throat> it's outside our rational living experience. Um, so, and it's, it just feels like, you know, my whole path has sort of mirrored the transpersonal in a way that it's just meant to be. And I found that I fitted into it really quite naturally. Um, and of course, it's about a, a spiritual e element as well, which I loved about the course because it included body, mind and spirit. Um, which a lot of other courses don't include. Thank you. So you've <laughs> given us Sorry. a hint. Sorry. I was just going to ask Margie whether it drew on, um, does it draw on knowledge from outside of Europe, because uh, Europe and North America, because an awful lot of therapies are very rooted in, in white, European, American um, teachings, aren't they? And I was just wondering whether that particular form of psychotherapy might be a bit yeah. broader. There's, there's a lot of um, Buddhist tra tradition. Um, and um, in fact, at CCP, a Sufi um, tradition as well, or taken, Rumi, um, taken into account. Um, but it's also very Jungian as well, um, working with metaphors and archetypes. So, yeah, it, in, in, it encompasses everything, the world. It's kind of like a global um, tradition in a way. Okay, what, do, what yeah. does transpersonal therapy look like in the therapy room? How would, how would we know it was a transpersonal therapy session? Okay, so um, basically, um, 
the transpersonal, the, the model, it's a model. Um, it's a psychotherapeutic model. And the, the one that I studied at CCPE is um, an integrative based model. So it involved all sorts of other um, ways of uh, therapeutic approaches like the Gestalt. However, we did things like breath and sound as well. We also learned about the psych psychodynamic approach. So, and we, we were allowed to take what we could from it based on, on ourselves. But people think of the transpersonal as a, as a religious uh, model. And it's not, it's got nothing to do with religion. There are no structures or rules based to it. Um, it's basically, um, it's about a personal journey and a journey of discovery. Um, and like other therapeutic models, it's about developing this ability to witness yourself or to observe yourself. And, and that you grow in consciousness and awareness um, and with this, you grow in creativity and imagination and a you know, sense of fun um, increases as well. And, and maybe your belief system, you know, and believing in something bigger than, than yourselves. Um, basically, the transpersonal is, is beyond the means beyond the personal. Okay, and um, sort of there are no words really to describe it because it's beyond um, the bounds of time and space, really, um, and beyond our ordinary personalities. Um, at CCP, what we were also taught was the alchemy of transformation. So basically, there's this ancient belief that... Um, when, when you, you know, when these um, people believe by adding lead to um, a pot and applying heat and stirring it, it would transform into gold. Well, it's a similar sort of belief that um, the transpersonal um, approach that I've learned has. So in other words, as you go to therapy, come to therapy, um, and you're in this therapeutic container, heat is applied, and, and there are various processes um, that you go through, and you start with Negredo, which is the dark night of the soul, and um, where things start falling apart, and um, your dreams change, and basically you go through all these processes of purification, you know, where there's um, purification by water, say emotion, very emotional, or parts of you die off. Um, um, and then gradually, as you go through this therapeutic process, more and more light starts filtering in, um, and hence the gold. And, it's a really nice metaphor. Yeah. And then, but the hardest part of the alchemical process, of course is then applying um, what you've learned about yourself into real life. You know, maybe it's in terms of relationship or getting, you know, motivated from work or something like that. But our transpersonal approach um, is very right-brained. So it's, it uses creative imagination um, and also the body. So there were various techniques we would use and by dropping into the, the body and evoking the right brain, which um, has been shown to be very healing. At CCPE, um, they also used the elemental model, um, which was a way of describing um, our personalities or our qualities, like someone might be quite airy, and in other words, they're quite intellectual or quick-witted. Um, someone might be quite fiery and passionate. Um, then other people might be more um, um, uh, emotional, which is more watery. 
all more stoical and grounded, which is the earth elemental model. And the, the whole process of therapy is about to bring balance and harmony between those different elements. So you have something of each within you. And also, I mean, I could go on there lots more to tell you, but the other thing, which was really the instigator, and you'll learn um, it to my IFS um, uh, interest, was we used to work with subpersonalities. So different parts of ourselves that would come to us through creative imagination. So I was just thinking about that sense for balance, Margie, and appreciation of all the different elements. And I wonder if, you know, I was just thinking about the fact that many schools of, of, of therapy um, uh, can become quite competitive with other models. Like there can be a over-identification with CBT as a or psychodynamic therapy, for mm -hmm. instance. And, and so you can end up with a devaluing of some approaches and uh, elevating of others. And it sounds like the transpersonal approach and that need for balance therefore recognises the, the strengths of different, different therapeutic models. Yeah, absolutely, because we would learn about them all, you know, well, not all of them, but, it, you know, there was CBT involved. I also now l lecture about um, trauma and, um, you know, give them an overview of different um, approaches used in the treatment of trauma. Um, and I think the belief at CCP was you take from it what you need based on who you are. And um, so some people, I would say, on a, if there was a continuum, work far more transpersonally than me mm -hmm. um, because I've gone more towards uh, working with the treatment of trauma but it's still an underpinning to what I to how I work and if some if any listeners were interested in um, digging a bit deeper into transpersonal psychotherapy are there any key um, authors that they should be any key writers they should be exploring okay so someone like John Rowan has written a book on the transpersonal Ken Wilber mm -hmm. Zagioli um oh, I can't think of them offhand. Um Groff. So um many and and the director of CCP has also written a book on on dreams. Um that's Nigel Hamilton. Thank you. I wonder, can you tell us a bit more about it? Um and how, how might a typical session go? Well, it's very, I would imagine it's very, very much like ordinary, everyday psychotherapy. But for instance, um, it might be, we, you know, thinking about, um, well, for instance, I see auras around people and that informs me of maybe how they are. I personally, I think it's a reflection of their soul or their self, but you could also think of it differently as them being regulated and, and really, um, you know, being calm, cool and collected. I'd, but it's also um, sometimes people bring issues with prayer or not that I, um, you know, they can talk about it. Um, people have um, feelings that maybe God's let them down, but I think that's included in 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 everything really. It's more my personal belief is a lot of it's around what is meant to be. Um, there are some extraordinary things that happen, um, like for instance, something that I can just off the top of my head. At one point, a client of mine said she she felt lit up and she was lit up. And then she said, you know, this is this is a spiritual experience. It's something beyond what had happened be, between um, herself and me. 
I sort of believe that in a way I'm a, a conduit between the universe or God, um, and it provides a sort of healing energy um, um, in, in the relationship. Um, I don't know if I'm explaining it very well. But... Yeah, I think it's coming on. Um, I, because it sounds to me as if you're describing something about your frame of mind and how you're open to communicate on a spiritual level uh, and an unconscious level. And, and do you then translate that to the person you're working with? Not always. No. I mean, it's, it's really something that comes with, it, it comes from the client. Um, not all my clients really understand what the transpersonal is. Um, when I say sometimes, you know, you are speaking to it, so, say someone would say something, you know, this is really weird, Margie, there's something bigger out there. And I would say something like, well, you're talking to a transpersonal psychotherapist. Oh, really, am I? You know, so they don't always understand, understand the nature of the transpersonal. Um, it's something bigger than us. Um, it's divine, it's, it's sacred. Um, you know, people believe in the universe or God. I personally think of the universe um, and, and how that in the, biggest, in the bigger sphere will influence us and our, our work and what happens between us. Make me think of a couple of things, Margie. One, one in that we've certainly had at least one guest on previously who spoke about being a person of faith and feeling like there wasn't much space for her faith as a practitioner and how quite often psychologists and psychotherapists come from more of a agnostic slash atheist background. So whether as a form of therapy, it's more attentive to to spirituality but it's also reminding me of Daniel Siegel's work on the concept of we and the idea that there's a shared something that's bigger than the bigger than the individuals absolutely and um um the it's certainly like an IFS therapy um which is internal family systems therapy they talk of the self which is really the essence of being, um, you could see it as the soul. And it's very, very difficult to put it in words because the moment you think you've got it, it's like mercury. It just flits away. Um, mm, thank you very much. Um, so moving on from that a bit, Margie, you specialised in working with people who were traumatised. What led you to prioritise this area? Well, again, David, it was just a path that I followed. When I um, did my second year at um, college, um, they talked about someone called John Bowlby. And John Bowlby had... Um, talked about um, boarding school and the effects of, you know, well, basically attachment and separation. And I just thought I had this light bulb moment and thought that man understands me. And because I had been to boarding school as a child from seven and I decided post my diploma to do some CPD in attachment, um, which I did. And, um, you know, it became more obvious to me that actually the reason that I was doing this was really not really helping others. It was because of my own attachment history and my own developmental trauma. And um, for a long time, I denied it. I um, had talked to people and said that I had almost a perfect childhood 
um, but that was a way of coping, a way of surviving, something that actually turned out wasn't so brilliant. Um, and so gradually, as I learned more and more about attachment and developmental trauma, um, I became more interested in it. And that's what led me into um, sensory motor psychotherapy as well. And um, sort of following um, both big T trauma, because I believe a lot of people who have developmental trauma um, also prone to accidents and um, certainly their recovery from, from big T trauma or single incident trauma, acute trauma, um, is much more complex and leads to you know, things like complex PTSD. And so it's been a kind of gradual um, process and it's just where my, my heart lies. And as I do more, you know, I work with my clients. I still have my own therapy. And, um, you know, I sort of delve deeper and deeper into what happened to me. And it becomes clearer and clearer the depth to which de developmental trauma can go and the impact on individuals. And, that, you know, that's just... I just feel I fit into it. It's helping me as well as helping others. Um, you know, our clients are our best teachers um, as well. It's really interesting, the, you know, talking about developmental trauma, because I think so often people don't recognise they have that. I think if people have experienced a big T trauma of sexual abuse or a you know a road traffic accident it's very easy for them to see that they've had a traumatic experience but I think so much of what children experience persistently and repetitively they just see as that just being part of family life and don't necessarily know any difference so don't necessarily appreciate how it might lead to a build-up of difficulties that come in adulthood around kind of like you know dysfunctional beliefs that hold us back in life and prevent us from from being you know shining at our best really yeah uh, absolutely and um uh, there's a phrase that I often hear oh he or she will get over it or they'll never remember it you know speaking in the context of a child well of course they might not have a verbal or explicit memory of something, but these traumas, um, and it, it doesn't need to be something accidental, but um, something neglected in childhood or um, shaming or contempt or betrayal, there may not be any words for it, but it's certainly laid down in a person's body, in their cells, and the body remembers and that that will influence how they view life they will see life through that trauma lens so move, moving on from that margaret at one point you were working in a prison weren't you what, what drew you into this line of work well um when i came back i lived in egypt when i came back from egypt um i decided to volunteer for the Samaritans here, and I, I um, volunteered at the Amersham branch, and they had an outreach program with Aylesbury Young Offenders, and um, I was particularly, I was drawn to it because somewhere along the line, and I can't remember where, I'd, I'd heard a, at some conference I had attended, I'd heard a plenary speaker talk about um, grief and bereavement and loss and how, I think in, at that time, he said at least 40% of young offenders have uh, had suffered a significant loss as a child and had unresolved grief. And I just, that really just drew on my heartstrings and I, I thought, you know, here are these young people who maybe could have been helped differently at some point earlier on in their life. 
And so I volunteered um, to, to work with, basically what they were doing was they were training young offenders in the prisons to be there as listeners for um, other um, offenders who, you know, who were feeling suicidal. So we didn't actually listen to prisoners, but we helped the helped those who were trained as listeners um, or flowed, and we helped them with training as well. And also, I have a sort of belief that if you're traumatized and you're living a life through a trauma lens, it is virtually like being in a prison because you end up surviving rather than thriving and living. So maybe there was something within me that recognized this lockdown living, as you said. You know. It's interesting you, you draw on that because actually a couple of our other guests who come from non-forensic backgrounds have said the locked up living very much applies across society in terms of how people might end up in quite restricted worlds and the, 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 that they inhabit as a consequence of, of early early adversity. But what, what was it like working in a prison as a non-operational staff member? What were the challenges of that? Well, um, so my, the biggest ch challenge I faced was my own fear and my own projections and assumptions. Um, and I remember walking in through the prison door, which was a huge, big wooden door, and then being searched. And um, and I, I absolutely remember tra trembling and walking through this um, avenue of prisoners. And I felt their eyes, uh, their eyes on us. But we went into an office and I, um, there was a, perspex screen and I looked out and I looked out at them and I remember what went through my head was oh they they just boys um or young men and it was like I, I don't know what I thought <laughs> you know um my projection was but they they were human and so I think my biggest challenge was overcoming my own fears and, and assumptions but I think I think it's interesting you talk about that because I think talking about fear is something that people are reluctant to do when it comes to working in prisons and I've heard so many people say oh no I was never frightened and I think well that doesn't make sense to go into places where you're confronted by the worst things that people can possibly do and not feel not feel frightened and I also remember working in a prison when I was 22 it was, it was my first first job in a prison and I was supposed to be doing some work with a young man who'd who'd killed and one of the governors of the prison came to ask who was working with this prisoner and to gleefully say to me his previous therapist was traumatized and with hindsight that was all done just to to deliberately engender fear in me this the the, the boy wasn't wasn't frightening at all um you know you could very easily see the vulnerability in him and he worked very well but it was the fact that that seemed to be an acceptable prank to play on a young woman in a, in a prison environment which you know wasn't pleasant at all but I wondered um if there were any things that you enjoyed about the work that you did in prison and what advice you'd give to anyone who's going to work in a prison right um so I'm not sure the word enjoy is is right um i i didn't do this for long but the thing that i really that really grew in me was a respect for the prisoners that we worked with some of whom had committed the most heinous of crimes and they but there they were working and really trying hard to turn their their lives around. And I think that's one of that was one of my take homes was, you know, you see the, the dark in people, but there's also this light 
And when given a chance, it will, you know, it will shine through. And no, I, I just, I think the thing that came home was the humanity of people. And I've always, I remember my, um, the director of um, CCP where, where I was trained said, you know, you, this is something like he said, it's not verbatim, but he said, you know, you're all here potentially capable of murder. And, and to this day, I always think oh, I'm so grateful that I haven't murdered and certainly I've never ended up in prison because it's not somewhere you want to be. That's very, um, very, that resonates very, very, very strongly, Margie. I think when people are complaining about people in prison having access to PlayStations and things like that, what they're missing is the deprivation that's there in terms of the loss of liberty. They're not being, you know, on a sunny day, not being able to go and walk out on, on grass and feel, feel grass beneath bare feet, never having any kind touch. All the nuances of, you know, those slight ways of connecting with people that, that bring value and colour into our lives, which are, prison's a very grey world, I think. Oh, absolutely. And just as you say that, Naomi, I have a picture of the prisons and, I mean, uh, we were shown around some of the cells as well and how cold and stark they are and how small and and grim and the noise. Um, nothing soft about it at all. Sure, they may have some privileges. Um, I didn't see very many. Um, but, yeah, it was, it's, it's brutal. Yeah. So we met when we um, both trained doing the sensory motor psychotherapy pathway um, and so worked quite closely together doing that for, for a number of years. What, what did you find especially useful about this approach? Well, um, I loved the way it integrated the body and um, was really quite creative. Um, and it, it dealt with both aspects of trauma both the developmental side as well as the, you know, the more acute side of, of um, trauma. Um, it also, I think it takes you much deeper um, and rather than talk therapy, I, you know, talk therapy only really touches the surface, whereas this is something, sensory motor psychotherapy is really healing. And um, and while I use it on my clients, having experienced it myself, I know that to be true. Um, it's certainly very enlightening and um, and holistic as well. Yeah. And, and you've subsequently pursued training in internal family systems. Can you tell us a little bit about this model and what you feel it's added to your therapeutic palette? Okay, so it was... Sensory motor psychotherapy also works with parts. Um, I think Janina ran the module, um, introduced parts work to us. It, and the belief is that we're all multiple. And we, and, um, and of course that exists on a, uh, on a continuum, but it's in our everyday la language. We will say something like, I'm, I'm beside myself with grief or John's not himself today. So, um, yeah, and I, I really like that concept. And, but with the sensory motor psychotherapy, of course, it, it was mostly body orientated rather than parts orientated. And I, I felt that um, doing IFS would sort of deepen the parts work, which um, it has done. And also for me, it's, it, sort of integrates the transpersonal very well because in IFS they talk about the self um, and and for me I know it's not for everybody but it does describe the essence or our soul nature and um, how 
the, the soul or um, is protected by um, hearts made up of um, firefighters or managers and um, the soul is is protected against overwhelm from little exiles and those are parts of ourselves who are traumatized they basically carry the burden of the memories and the emotions um, of the traumatic past and the, the belief is that the managers kind of work to keep the exiles in prison in the past you could see it that way in order to prevent the um the emotion or the memory from um swamping or overwhelming the self or the soul and but sometimes um when we triggered these little exiles or very often very young parts of ourselves um sort of jump through the barrier and um along come the firefighters who are really quite extreme protectors and what they do is they um they they also may actually protect those vulnerable parts from being hurt again or again protect the soul or the self from being um, overwhelmed and some of the extreme protectors may be something like um, uh, reaching for a drink um, eating chocolate, I have a pot that likes chocolate, um, shopping, gambling, um, dissociating, whereas some of our managers might be a critic, always putting us down so that we don't raise our head above the parapet, or um, uh, hardworking, um, caretaking is another manager. And so what ends up happening is these, the managers and the firefighters end up obscuring the, the self um, and the whole essence or the idea behind IFS is that they are no bad parts. They are all there for a reason. Um, so for example, reaching for the chocolate when I do, is to self is to self soothe is to calm down a probably a little emotional part that's feeling sad or upset. Um, whereas the the manager, I have a manager who is a critic, and they they will always tell me, "Oh, you're not doing this right. You've got to work harder. You've got to be better at this." And this is because in my past, um, you know, I've been rejected. And so there's a belief system attached to my little exile that if I work harder and I do better, maybe I'll be loved more. So, and that's but the essence of, of IFS is to begin to befriend all these parts, to value them, to acknowledge them, to accept them. And, and actually, if you th think of it through sensory motor psychotherapy, terms which works with the three phase model and the first phase being regulating by accepting um, our parts people begin to feel more regulated um, and um, karma which brings in some of the self qualities but also what we do with the um, the little exiles and this really ties in with the transpersonal model that I studied, which was based, we worked on an elemental principle that there are four elements, air, fire, water, and earth. And some people are more airy, they live in their heads. Some people are more fiery, you know, they charge out, they are hardworking and, and go-getting. Some people are more watery, more creative, and um, and um, emotional and then the earthy types are more um, you know stoical and um, um, grounded. In the IFS model when we unburden the exiles we can let go help them let go their burden to the air 
or to fire or to um, uh, water or to the earth, which is very much using the right brain. So using active imagination, which as we know can be really healing and it sets down new neural pathways. So what ends up happening is people start changing and their relationship with themselves starts changing. And basically I think it's a word that's very seldom used in psychotherapy textbooks. This is about love um, and falling in love with yourself and also, you know, spreading love and sending love to other, other people uh, and modeling it for them as well. It's a really beautiful explanation there, Margie, for internal family systems. And, and you kind of like referenced the book that Dick Schwartz wrote, No Bad, no Bad Parts, which mm-hmm. I think really sums up the spirit. I mean, he appears to be quite a religious person himself in terms of some of the work that he's trying to do in terms of spreading love throughout the world but in forensics services quite often people are familiar with uh, schema focused therapy which also draws on the idea that we have might have different parts doing different doing different things um, or you know we get into a different mode um, but I think what's really nice about the internal family systems is that rather than try and silence and squash and challenge those parts it's about embracing and allowing more space mm-hmm. and actually paradoxically by allowing more space there's less less need for them to take up space because they're able to be absorbed and integrated into the into the core self aren't they yeah and also what it what ends up happening is a lot of these parts have been forced into roles when as children and and rather than doing things that they don't want to do like um for instance um criticizing they might want to do something different they would have these parts may have wanted to do maybe to be more informative um offer offer judgment and guidance rather than criticism so it's it's helping people reach their natural and the parts reach their natural potential rather than having to do something in order to survive Thank you. And just before we give way to David to give him some space here in the conversation, I just wanted to ask you about your background in uh, entomology and ask whether whether that influences how you are as a psychotherapist, do you think? Oh, well, it's really in my interest in entomology stem from my interest in biology. And what I love about um, uh, how it's integrated into my work is that I love um, learning about neuroscience, the body, the nervous system, the polyvagal theory, and having, and it's really tied in, you know, my early learning. Uh, I have a background in science, and um, psychotherapy is both an art and a science, and certainly I've, I've certainly loved learning more about the impact of of trauma on the body and on the brain and how the brain and the body can be um, healed too through psychotherapy. Yeah, I find it very exciting. Thank you. That was a very interesting uh, conversation you were having. Um, It reminds me really of the psychodynamic model which I might use which posits uh, an internal world, which consists of innumerable um, part objects, interjected experiences and people, um, which which is a fluid system. And I suppose my problem with um, um, I've got the name for it now. Well, you mentioned Naomi. Um, anyway, schema schema focused schema. schema. <clears throat> which I regard as being a, a much more static model. Um, anyway. It's probably worth, just worth saying there, I think that's that's a criticism I've heard a few times. I mean, I have to say, I do really like the schema-focused therapy model, but I also really like internal family systems. And I think one of the 
things about internal family systems is the parts are very unique to the individual. So we might, all of us or many of us might relate, for instance, to a critical part, um, but we all have lots of different parts and, you, and those parts can be as many as there are people in the world, whereas schema focused therapy tends to, I think, try and have common strategies that are used across you know a limit a finite number of strategies that are used across individuals mm -hmm. may have changed I may be talking talking from old knowledge but because I haven't done recent training in skin focus therapy mm -hmm. yeah okay well moving on um you've obviously um uh, ab absorbed and made a part of yourself several different uh uh, models of uh, psychotherapy, which is fascinating in itself, how you manage to kind of fuse these and uh, utilize them in the work that you you do. But perhaps we're not dealing with that today. But um, so thinking about becoming a psychotherapist, though, what factors do you think people should consider if they're thinking of training as a psychotherapist? Mm. Yeah. Well, things that I didn't think of, and one is that if you go into private practice, you it's actually a business. And I have parts of me who don't like keeping records. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so there's the business side of it that one really needs to think about. Also, quite unsociable hours um, that people can work unless you're working for the NHS, but in private practice, a lot of um, people come after work. <clears throat> so, excuse me, so I do work into the evenings. Um, in placements, um, you don't earn money, so mostly volunteering. And of course, if you're in self, employment you don't earn you don't get paid when you're on holiday and it takes time to set up a practice having said having said and it's a lot of work and there's ongoing training but that's something personally I love so it's not you know, it's just something that we can grow and expand in ourselves um, I do however really love working for myself and I've grown my practice in a way that's been really individual, that suits me. Um, and it's hard work. It really is hard work. It can be quite isolating. It, if you, I'm talking from a private practice point of view because you work um, in a room, um, unless you're sharing a building, there's very little interaction be between people between people I mean it's something I I can't share things that have happened with my husband for example but having said that I have a really close network of colleagues um, do intervision with them and supervision with them and I think it's also it really takes friendships between colleagues to a different level as well, which I've really enjoyed. Um, and In what way? What do you mean by that? Well, there's a kind of openness. People tend to be able to be more vulnerable. Um, uh, more, yeah, obviously good listeners. I mean, it's maybe a generalization but normally people can be you know really there for you so um I've, I've certainly found a real closeness amongst colleagues that I work with wrong as opposed to other jobs that I've worked in um, um and my word it, it when people change and transform it is just like one of the most beautiful things you can see. Um, and, and it's really quite intimate, you know, something really special that occurs between 
a client and a therapist to see these changes. Um, and I love it that it's not shouted from the rooftops. It's something that's really private and um, just really heartfelt. Um, so that's the uh, reward at the end, really seeing people change and develop. Yeah, I, I find that so. Uh, it can take a long time. And it's not always obvious at once. But, you know, there might be something really profound. Um, like, for instance, someone forming a relationship when they didn't have one before. Or following a dream that they always thought was impossible. Um, it's really heartwarming. Thank you. Well, the first thing you mentioned there, Margie, was um, keeping records, the, the kind of bureaucratic side of the business. How did you overcome that? Um, how do I? I have a part of me who, who just makes me do it. <laughs> right. Possibly because I'm, a, um, yeah, maybe there's another part of me who's a little bit fearful of getting things wrong and um, ending up in trouble. Um, yeah. So it it's just something that I have to knuckle down and do. <laughs> I recognise that part, you see, that's why I'm asking. <laughs> um, and uh, I still hate keeping oh. records and filing invoices and all that kind of stuff. Oh. And then uh, when it comes to reaccreditation, or putting that all together and counting up all the hours and oh well it feels like doing a PhD <laughs> to me yes mm. and I Thank don't you. get the initials after my name <laughs> what's the thing you found most personally challenging about supporting people as they work through their trauma Margie um the thing that's most personally challenging for me personally is um, it can be quite tiring. Um, for me personally, setting boundaries has been quite difficult. Um, given my early childhood, um, where boundaries were broken, it was only until I was in my fourth year of um, uh, my diploma that I learned that boundaries existed. Was, it came as quite a surprise to me. Um, so I have one of the hardest things is saying no um, when I get a referral. And I had one recently and it really, you know, tugged at my heartstrings. And I find that very, very hard saying no. But it's not fair either to the client or to myself taking on more work then I can really um cope with so I would say that's my most challenging thing and and that continues it's always continued thank you and finally because we're coming to the end how, how do you keep yourself emotionally nourished whilst doing this work okay so I have my own therapy um friends I have two dogs that I walk um, every afternoon I go for a walk and I just love walking in nature and really taking pleasure in simple things like sunlight on a spider's web or dew on a flower. Um, I do yoga, um, yoga nidra. I, I pray and I also exercise spread of activities there to to keep you healthy yeah it's been a lovely conversation margie thank you very much for coming on and, and sharing those stories with us well thank you very much for having me thanks very much yeah. margie that was really interesting fascinating actually thank you thanks very much <laughs>